Hello, it's race week once more, Magello race week, in fact, as the Premier Class heads to Italy for round eight of the Moto GP World Championship. On the show today, the KTM conundrum. We've not spoken too much about the Austrian manufacturer with a win and a podium to their name so far in 2022. As we head into the European season, are they approaching, well, their usual slump? We've also got the very latest from the rider Merry Go Round in full swing at the moment. And of course, a look forward to Mugello this weekend. The recording date is Monday, the 23rd of May. My name is Harry Benjamin. Joining me as ever is Crash Moto GP editor Pete McLaren and former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Hewin. Hello, gents. Always a pleasure to see you on a Monday morning. I do enjoy our chats. Um, KTM, I want to start there, if I may, before we dive into the nitty gritty. We haven't spoken much about them, really. They've had a couple of highs right at the start of the year with the win with Miguel Oliveira uh, and a podium. Binder performing well, too. Oliveira is out of contract, isn't he, at the end of this season, I believe. And Tech 3 still, Keith, in a bit of no man's land as well. They're two rookies not improving on on, on what Petrucci and, and Laquona were able to achieve last year. So, I mean, KTM just seem like they're in a little bit of no man's land at the moment. Yeah, great expectations is where we were. Um, it looked mm. like KTM had really got some momentum going, but uh, it's just fell flat on its face this year. The To, to do the Guy Coulon, Hervé Poncherel team, Tech 3, or Tech 2, as some Tech-toi. would prefer, mm. um, Two rookies in a in a in a team like that as a satellite factory team, you know that could have gone one of both ways and uh, one of two ways, and it has gone the wrong way, hasn't it? It just hasn't quite worked out. Injury in there, KTM not working great as a factory team as it is at the moment anyway, not performing as the way it should do. The early Grand Prix are always strange, you know. Sometimes you get odd results at those early Grand Prix, and we have. Um, I think now it's difficult, isn't it, with KTM? Uh, with that momentum, you might have thought they would have been able to pull something out of the bag come 2022, but it hasn't happened for them. And it's not down to luck anymore. I mean, the the, the step that everyone's made is quite minute compared with the steps that have been made in recent decades. But the fact is, I think the factories and this rule book, as it is at the moment, they're getting the maximum amount of what they've got uh, on track. And KTM are just those few tenths off. And that makes a lot of difference nowadays. So... You know, what they're going to do about it. One thing I will say about KTM, they are ruthless. When you've seen them, the way they deal with their riders and they deal with their teammate, uh, team internal team, um, don't expect them to uh, sit back. They will have a plan. They will ruthlessly carry it out. Um, but it's almost a situation, Pete, where you'd want no podium points so you get some concessions back at some stage. Um, it's almost like you, you sort of tell your riders not to score anything for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, they, they, yeah, those early rounds, as you say, Keith, it started off great, didn't it? We weren't sure going into this year. You know, there were a few question marks because they kind of, they, they sort of cancelled the, the planned project for this year's new bike, didn't they? It didn't go in the direction they wanted, and they decided, look, let's just let's just really explore what we've got and try and iron out this inconsistency for this year. And it all looked great at these opening rounds, as you're saying, Keith. You know, but you can't draw too much into it. And then we've come into this, you know, the the things have settled down and unfortunately for KTM, they've settled down not very well. Really Brad Binder's the only guy really carrying them at the moment, isn't he? And the other guys are really struggling. And look at Honda. I mean, Honda have got that sort of chucked all the new bits at the bike and it isn't working for Mark Marquez either. Whether Mark Marquez is the same Mark Marquez that he was previously um, is debatable as well. But the fact is that Honda haven't managed to make it work. Yamaha are almost with it with doing nothing. They're still in the ballpark. We keep talking about oh, Yamaha. You know, haven't improved anything, but they, they're still there or thereabouts, aren't they? With with a motorbike that hasn't had anything really done to it. So you know, it's Ducati now. I think Ducati's momentum now is beginning to move. Um, and then the Suzuki thing. I mean, what do we say about that? Still, I mean, they. I mean, all Suzuki have managed to do is blow the rider market apart. It's just you know, it's tanked <laughs> as I said it would. You know, as soon as you've got a world champion and a pretty good um, second rider available um they, yeah it's funny rider markets are quite volatile and everyone's you know bumping the price up bumping the price up their management are behind them bumping the price up but i tell you what probably they'd all do it for nothing <laughs> if that was the case um and i think we're, we're fast getting to the point where we're all at a 50 percent sale at the moment it's all going to be a massive discount because of what suzuki had done and look at i mean you actually you can talk about alacious bargro alacious bargro not that he is never spitting tax, because he always is. He's always got something to whinge about, Elish. But quite justifiably at the minute, 
you know, the fact that he's not really been offered a, a, a what I would consider a, a sensible deal for, for for being retained at Aprilia. I mean, Aprilia have taken the opportunity really to trim his um, his offer, despite the fact he's had more podiums than any other rider on the grid, which is amazing. It is amazing, and it's good. it's going to blow the rider market apart, isn't it? Just uh, sorry, Pete. Just just before we we move on properly to the rider market, there's a question that's come in from John Andrew Wheeler. Um, and it's on, you mentioned about Brad Binder and also the fact KTM can be quite ruthless. Uh, John has asked, how crucial is Brad Binder for KTM? You have to think, if he gets the right bike under him, he can be in for a win just about every weekend. It was crazy finishing eighth in Mandalika with a stuck ride height device and an eighth last weekend with only one uh, one wing. It astounds me. Was wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, Brad is he's carrying that project at the moment, isn't he? I mean, this is you know, there's a lot of talented guys in the KTM project. Miguel Oliveira, as we know, multi multi time race winner, but it's just it's not clicking into place for him again. And we thought it would be at the start of this year. He got that that win. Okay, it was in the wet, but you know, it was all looking good. We're of course coming back to Mugello, where he got in dry conditions second place last year. But it seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Um, you know, the KTM that. that there's not one obvious thing wrong with it. This is this is the difficulty now, as Keith's been explaining. The bikes are all so close. There's not just, oh, well, that's the bit that needs fixing. They need a little bit from sort of a lot of areas. And, and it's so hard to make that step when you have all these bikes are good now. You know, there's no bad bikes on the MotoGP grid. And it's trying to find these tiny differences. Um, you know, Remy Gardner, he's been speaking about the Tectoire team. You know, he was being quite open that he thinks they now they need some new parts, that they've done everything they can with what they've got. And they're not able to sort of make the step that they need to make the bike more competitive. He's been having problems with the back coming up under braking. They can fix that, but then it won't turn as well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, it's difficult times. I mean, at Le Mans, I think they expected that to be quite a good weekend for them because the bike has traditionally been good at braking. Instead, it was a really you know, quite difficult weekend. I mean, it was summed up. Remy was asked what about the weather conditions for the race because uh, it was looking a bit iffy, and he said, "Well, the best ones for them would be a, a tornado to come and rip the track up." I mean, and that pretty much summed up <laughs> what they were expecting from the weekend. So, yeah, you know, difficult times, and and yeah, it, I mean, it seems like they they are waiting now for some new parts to come in. But it's it's the trick is not new parts, as Keith says. You can throw new parts at a bike. It has to address what the issue is, and that's the difficult part, especially when you've got concessions, testing's limited. You can't send your Grand Prix riders out to go and do private tests anymore. It's hard, it's, you know, and they're in a they're in a difficult situation. But Brad Binder, to come back to the question, is undoubtedly the guy. He, he's a bit like their Mark Marquez. He's a bit like their Fabio Quattararo at Yamaha, isn't he? He's the guy that that's the, that that somehow gets a result, pulls it out the hat, even when they're having a difficult weekend. Probably have as well. It compounds that that, that riders and and team members they drop the head. At some stage, you know, they're demanding all these bits and pieces and the bits and pieces come and they're perhaps not working the way they thought they would work. And suddenly that starts to rot from the inside outwards. And, and riders really, really do, you know, start believing that they've not got the bike that will do the business. And that's where the likes of Binder is a figurehead in that team because he's a South African. There's, there's something about a South African nature as well, isn't it? That, you know, they, they're gritty. They, they get on and and shape the thing into submission. You know, there are, there are certain riders, certain types of riders that are out there, whereas there are others who, who'd whinge a bit about it and sort of, you know, feel a bit sort of that they're not getting the treatment that they should be getting, um, slightly deaverish, if you like. But uh, so Binder really is a figurehead at the moment in KTM. He should be the man that they focus on to, to, to try and get that whole team pulled up behind him. But like you said, big deal not testing the problem is is when you're in this hole that they're in at the moment you've almost got to slip a bit further into the hole so that you regain concessions for a following year so you can start picking up momentum on development again so it, it's kind of not where you want to be you know it's almost like instruct the riders not to perform so you get your concessions back later on you know it's, it's a, that's an odd situation it certainly is, isn't it? Well, uh, we'll see how they get on uh, this weekend. But uh, I think that brings us nicely on to chat about the 2023 rider market, which we've already touched on already. It's been blown apart uh, by, well, the Suzuki news, really. It was already heating up a little bit, but that's just certainly, I think, knocked everyone a little bit 
uh, for six. What does it mean for everybody up and down the grid? Keith, your man performing well, well, and and oh, and a bit of controversy in World Superbikes at the weekend. Top back Raz Gassioglu, rumoured for a while, testing with Yamaha. Will he find a place on the grid for next year? Franco Morbidelli not performing too well. What are your thoughts on that situation? Yamaha would be mad to overlook Top Rack. I mean, Keenan Sofoglu, the you know, his manager and what, six times world or five times world super sport champion, <coughs> knows that market really well. He's going to ruffle a few feathers on both sides of the fence, on the rider side of the fence and on the management side of the fence. I can see Keenan being a really tough, tough negotiator. Uh, Yamaha, what choices do they have? You've got, you know, Razgatli Oglu, uh, in the wings in World Superbike. I mean, anybody that watches him. World Superbike is well watchable again because of him, Jonathan Ray, and lately, Alvaro Bautista. Um, you know, they're they're all in it. I mean, when you watch what they're doing with them bikes, I mean, I have to say, out of all the races I watched at the weekend, that was the one. I mean, the, the first round between uh, uh, Estoril, between Top Rack and, and Jonathan was just... They were throwing the motorbikes at each other. I've never seen anything quite like it. It was, it was stunningly skillful stuff, stunningly skillful stuff. You would have called it reckless, I think, in the past, but because it was those two, you know, it was just brilliant to watch. I mean, like, honestly, the airs are standing up on my arms now while I'm bloody talking about it, let alone watching it. Really was something a little bit special. And he is, so is Jonathan, but Jonathan is of an age where, unfortunately, and it is so unfortunate, I still rue the day that Honda didn't do what they should have done back in the day when they should have got Jonathan Ray on a, on a proper factory Honda um, and kept him there. <clears throat> but but uh, Razgadioglu is definitely going. They're, they're, I mean, I'm absolutely convinced. I can't believe that he won't have a top-line ride in MotoGP in 2023. Money-wise is the big problem at the moment. I touched on it earlier. Aleish has made it quite clear that he's not happy with the deal that he's been offered by Aprilia. Aprilia are a little factory anyway. Um, maybe they're taking advantage of the fact that having a couple of factory Suzuki blokes now in the uh, mix, um, everyone's going cheap. All of a sudden, it's uh, if you've done the deal already, you'll be rubbing your hands together thinking, I'm glad I got that one done. Because right now, there's a 50% sale with these top guys on on there. And, and you know, Aleish deserves whatever his demands are. I, you know, I wouldn't imagine him being the um, top paid rider in the, in the paddock anyway. Um, but he should be getting there now. I mean, the fact that he's consistently on the podium compared with, you know, he's top top podium man. What's he had? Three third places uh, and a win. I mean, that's not bad considering where we are in the season. <clears throat> what will Yamaha do? Blimey, they have got a tough job. They really have. Dovi's got to be out. So that's that's fairly simple. Um, Morbidelli, if he don't start performing, then he might be going the same way. The one thing that this probably has done, Harry, is is steadied up the, the ship a little bit in that, you know, why would you want to make a decision on who you were going to have in your team if you haven't already made that decision? Mm. Why would you make that early? You know, Mugello really is traditionally the kind of weekend that we're coming to where those announcements are made. But if I was management, I'd be, yeah, hang on, let's hang off a little bit. Why, why would we need to make it so early? Yeah, okay, if there's a PR job to be done. Let's do that. Let's announce a new sponsor. Let's announce a new, and, you know, this, that, and the other. But let's just hang back a bit with the rider market and see how this all flops out. It, it's an, it, you're right, actually, Pete, and as well on this, Rin saying he's talking to Yamaha too, so throw him into the mix. But rumours are that the, the RNF, the, the satellite Yamaha team as well, we, we expect Dovi to probably go at the end of the year. Rumoured they might switch to Aprilia to, to sort of, take up that bat on and that's going to suddenly harm the chances of maybe a top rack if they want to bring him in there or, or younger rookies you know so what's the impact of that it's, it's, it's going to be a really sort of bit of maneuvering that has to go on in the next few months exactly Harry. yeah there's, there's so many pieces to this puzzle isn't there it's not just the the, the you know at first sight the rider team put them together there you go mm. at the moment there isn't a satellite yamaha team for next year there's no contract signed with anybody to run satellite yamaha so they would you know as things stand right now there is a seat alongside Franco Morbidelli. Morbidelli already has a contract for next year. Um, so, and of course, we expect that seat to go to Quattararo. I mean, you know, it'd be madness for him not to stay. Uh, so, I mean, the top rack thing, would that, I mean, that actually quite, it's quite a powerful pull factor for Yamaha to stay with RNF or to keep that satellite team. Because as you say, otherwise, where else would they put him? They risk losing him, really, um, to another manufacturer. We've got this, this test coming up that we believe is going to happen, I think, in... 
you know, in June, probably Aragon somewhere, presumably with the Yamaha test team. So you'll have Cal there, which is perfect, isn't it? You know, Cal, MotoGP race winner, someone who's come from Superbike as well. He's made that transition. He knows the sort of pitfalls that, that, that Superbike riders can make when they first get onto a MotoGP bike. All of his data to compare with, advice from Cal, uh, you know, I mean, that's the final box to tick for me. I think coming back to this question of top back and MotoGP, the way he was riding at the weekend, it's it's that Marquez style, isn't it? You know, I was saying this as someone who's not an ex rider, but just looking at it, that you know, the the back wheel in the air, the Marquez style save, even. I mean, fantastic, wasn't it? But would that work with the Yamaha? That's the only bit that you maybe think. You know, there's certainly bikes on the Reggie GP grid. You can imagine that style working very well with. How would it get on with the Yamaha? We'll see at this test. I think that's that's sort of the final the final box to tick as far as top rack. Apart from as Keith mentions putting together the contract, the money, and all these other factors that, that maybe people overlook, but they're going to be important. He's he's a well-paid guy in Superbike, and uh, he's doing very well there. And let's face it, it's going to be Will Superbike's loss if he does go to MotoGP, isn't it? I mean, what a, what a shame if this fantastic rivalry that we're seeing now has to come to an end. Of course, it never lasts forever, but you know this this great three-way fight that they've got this year in Superbike will end with Top Rank leaving for MotoGP. That's the only thing that, that maybe will be a shame. But for his career, and I think he deserves to have a chance in MotoGP, absolutely. If he goes MotoGP, there'll be a lot of big names that will be coming to World Superbike. So I wouldn't be too worried about that, in actual fact. The market is, uh, okay, it might, might con- you know, some would consider World Superbike to be a league down, if you like, compared with MotoGP. <clears throat> and getting back to the bike thing, how would he get on with the MR? It's funny how manufacturers, they have this kind of DNA in the way that they make motorbikes whether it be the production bike through to the factory uh, MotoGP bike. And, and you know, we've, we've heard it so many times with Ducati. It's funny enough, a friend of mine bought a, a Ducati for a track day bike the other day. He said, God, it doesn't steer very well compared with his Yamaha. It's funny how it's... So what I'm saying is the DNA of, of what Top Rack has been used to. And remember that Valentino and all the others, they use R1s for, for, for test track days and bits and pieces as well. I think that DNA is there. And I think that Top Rack will get on the bike and he's going to love it. He's going to love it. But Yamaha have still got to pick up the pace and give him what they need for 2023. He's, I mean, he, Keenan's not a daft sod, is he? I mean, he, he sort of balked at the idea of Top Rack coming across to a satellite team this year, if you like, and uh, if that was an availability or whether it was just PR, I don't know. But, but at the end of the day, 2022 would have been a bad year for Top Rack to come across. 2023 might be the perfect year. And just on Alicia Spargo, just, just to add to that, I mean, I think they're going to come to a deal. I have to say, I think that, you know, they're going through the, the motions, aren't they? And, and we always have this. The one side says they want this amount of money. The other side says we haven't got it. And then they always meet in the middle. I think for me, it will only get serious if Aprilia sign another rider before a ledge. And I think then you'll know that there is a real problem going on with the negotiations. We saw that with Dovi and Ducati. They signed, Ducati signed Jack Miller and they didn't sign Dovi first. And sure enough, no agreement was, was reached with Dovi. So I'm not sure. There, there was a bit on, uh, I think it was an Instagram video of Prilia put out with Alonso and uh, and Aleish and, and Maverick. I think they were at some sort of mini bike track, weren't they? And there was the joke about the contract. Well, you know, do you really, would you put out, I know it was a joke, but, uh, you know, you wouldn't put that out, would you, if, if there really was a, a real genuine wall between them in terms of their negotiation. So I think it's just, it's what happens when you have, managers and riders and, and contracts up for renewal there's also the bonus issue keith raised the podium thing alish is making a lot of money from 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 bonus money at the moment and you can bet that aprilia will be saying for next year well hang on a minute this bike is now a regular <laughs> podium finisher the bonus for a podium isn't going to be as high as it was before it's all of that kind of stuff that they're going to be working through but yeah for, for me personally i think they i'd be i'd be shocked and it'd be a travesty if they don't renew i think that that, that Aleish has done enough sticking with the team for this long and being well paid for it, that they should remain together for at least the next two years. And then let's see. But uh, yeah, who knows? But that's my view. I think until, you know, if Aprilia were to sign someone else first, yes, then I think, OK, they're in trouble. But let's see how it goes. And who knows? Italian race this weekend. Maybe they'll surprise us with an announcement. And then there's Paulus Bargro, who's looking pretty weak as well at the moment. His brother. That's another situation that could um, go a bit pear shaped. So it's all happening in the rider market. The place to be is on the Urta deck at Trapside in Mugello. It always I love is. the International Race Teams Association deck and watching all the management scurry for the alleyways together, trying to work out where they're going to put people and how much they're going to put them there for. 
Uh, every time, I think that needs to be renamed the Keith Hewan deck. Just, uh, just. Uh... Yeah, I, I think it should. It should have a plaque on the chair, yeah, shouldn't it? The, yes. the Keith Hewan chair. <laughs> With a, I hope there's a drinks and snacks served as well. Uh, if you if you uh, manage to grab a seat, uh, book it book Berta, in advance. Berta hate you using those chairs. They they they're, they're, they're there for for for, nego- for proper team jobs, not for um, somebody like me scrounging coffee and um, observing management. Uh, well, it it might be a, a good weekend to do that because we think potentially it is the Italian Grand Prix. There might be some news from uh, Ducati. We spoke in length about that. Also, Jack Miller also talking to KTM as well, apparently. So we know how brutal KTM can be. Um, but on, on the Honda subject, there could be a lot of changes there, right? Because Joanne Mir confirmed he is talking to Honda. Absolutely. We've seen the struggles for Paul Espargaro. Taka Nakagami uh, in LCR Honda... Uh, under threat from uh, some of the Moto2 boys, perhaps Ayagura in particular, you know, and, and Nakagami has perhaps had, has he used up his nine lives now? You know, he hasn't quite been able to, to make that breakthrough yet in, in, in his MotoGP career. I think you've said it all, Larry. I don't think there's much you can yeah. add to that, really. I mean, it, to be fair, it's um, it's something that we've been touching on for, for some weeks now. Nakagami really, with Ayagura, if he, if he comes up, he's, he's the fit, isn't he? It, it works quite well. I mean, even Somkiat Chantra, the the tie rider, who's, who's looked pretty good as well. I mean, if he can stick some consistency together, it's been his it's been his bugbear over the over the months and years, you know. And he's a great personality. Who'd not see that set of teeth on telly, you know? So you've you've got you've got some good guys that are that are hanging in the wings at the moment, so, and that's without rearranging the the pawns you've already got on the on the board. It's it's going to be a very interesting couple of months. I was just going to say, could be three three new Honda riders next year, couldn't they? I mean, Marquez is obviously signed. He's He's got two more years to run. But you wouldn't be surprised if, if all of the other seats change. Well, lots to uh, keep uh, abreast of. Crash.net for all the very latest, of course. Not that you need telling that. And it will be a busy weekend. Let's look forward to it then, shall we? Uh, Magello. Um, and it's going to be quite a monumental weekend, actually. Uh, and Valentino Rossi uh, back well, in number form, the number 46, Keith, uh, is set to be retired this weekend officially. Yeah, he'll be there. It will be the um, just before qualifying on Saturday. So anybody that wants to tune in and um, you know have a look at Valentino at Mugello, which who doesn't? I mean, it's the scene of so many fantastic Valentino. Yeah, what did he win? Something like seven consecutive MotoGP races, I think it was, that he won. I, I, I was trying to think whether it was eight, but I think it was seven that he won. Uh, across from Honda, he won a couple on Honda and the rest on Yamahas. Mugello, even though Misano really is his home track because he's only down the road at Tavulia, um, Mugello is the Italian Grand Prix. It has the title of Italian Grand Prix. And that whole bank, you know, going up the hill from San Donato and then those flip-flops up, up to Luca and the like, um, covered in yellow. I mean, you, you go back to the times of fighting with Biaggi and, and, and that, that, you know, it's just they had to have armed guards there. I mean, Rossi Mania at Mugello had got so out of control that they had to actually put the the local, you know, dad's army out to, to try and keep everybody in place because it was just nuts. And you can understand why. I mean, a complete legend. Something like, did he do something like 27 years? I think it was. He had his first international win at Mugello um, back in the 125 days. You know, like the history of Valentino and Mugello are, are just, you know, entwined together. It's what a bloke. And the 46 will be retired just before qualifying on Saturday. And we'll all tune in and, and probably have a little bit of a tear in our eye regarding Valentino. I mean, there's no track invasion like a Valentino Rossi track invasion ever. Not not everyone agrees with retiring numbers, of course. Uh, I know some people have mixed opinions about it. We've seen it. But, I mean, if you're going to retire numbers, you've got to retire the most famous of them all, haven't you, in, in two-wheel sport? Rossi himself said, I remember back in 2016, it, he actually wasn't that keen on his number being retired back then. But, I mean, now it's a, it's a big brand, isn't it, the VR46 thing? And, you know, we've seen Casey Stoner's number, 27, Marcus Simoncelli, Kevin Schwantz, Nicky Hayden. So, you know, we've seen other numbers retired, let's say. So whatever you think about it, if you're going to retire them, you've got to retire the 46, haven't you really? So some people are a bit cynical saying, oh, you know, this announcement came out only 
a week or so ago at Le Mans? And is it because ticket sales were a bit low? This, of course, being the first Italian Grand Prix without Rossi, isn't it? And everyone's a bit unsure. As Keith's saying, he's had such a long history at this track. He's missed races. He missed the 2010 race when he got injured there. But, you know, this is the first Italian Grand Prix since he's actually left the sport. So I think people will just be looking to see what effect that has. You've got to believe that there'll be plenty of fans in the, on the hillsides, as Keith says, and uh, you'll be getting plenty of support all the same, even though he's no longer racing. It was quite sad that we finished on in 2021, really, with with you know with the end of the pandemic. With, you know, the trackside didn't have the same atmosphere as it would have had. Jason De Pasquier was killed in qualifying uh, that weekend as well. So it was a, a real cloud over Mugello last year, which was, of course, Rossi's last Mugello. So um, as a racer, so it was it was quite a you know well it wasn't quite a sad event. It was a massively sad event. I think everybody felt Jason's loss hugely and uh, and it was quite raw and it was the weekend obviously that he valentino uh, made the announcement that he was retiring at the end of the year so it was a momentous 2021 uh, this year i think we're looking forward to a cracking race that's for certain and uh, it will be full again it certainly will be i think it will be an emotional weekend uh, for, for many reasons you touched there keith though on on some of those moments uh, around Mugello w- with rossi and his italian uh, glory days can we dive a bit more into that and your favorite moments uh, from rossi and at Mugello? nice biaggi moments to remember i think that if you've never been to Mugello, even without rossi you should go and imagine what it's like it is absolutely unbelievable ferrari owned the track <laughs> formula one formula one seemed to have only just found out how good Mugello is when they couldn't go anywhere else. I don't know what's the matter with you, like Harry. I really don't. It's a great uh, racetrack. I, I asked myself um, the same question. <laughs> where else? Can you, where else can you stand at the track side? It's, it's like a a valley that you're you're going you know along each side of it and then down in the middle of it. It's incredible amphitheater that that is just riotous. Um, two hundred twenty-five mile an hour because you're coming onto the front straight fairly quickly. The braking point is just on the top of a hill, if you like. So the first corner, San Donato, is, is an incredible spectacle. It really is something a bit special. 225 mile an hour, those bikes are moving some air around them at that. Rossi, you can't beat a Rossi-type situation. And of all the Rossi jewels, it's always Biaggi that's in my mind. I mean, Biaggi, that, that kind of very near hatred. Um, that they both had for each other. I think it was respect, but I'm not sure. It was a kind of that hatred slash respect type situation. So it must be like 2005 when they had their their duel there as well. I mean, there have been other times where, you know, Alvaro Batista, when he took um, Rossi out that time, you you think to yourself, this man is not going to get out of here without a helicopter and an armed guard. (laughs) Um, Mugello itself has this tiny little service road that comes out of Scarperia that's up the road. Um, and you, you can't get in or out of it. It's full of people walking. It's like a, a mile and a half, two miles of walking people. You can be there for five hours trying to get out of the track in the evening. Um, doesn't matter how smart you are or how many, um, we've all got routes through fields and dirt tracks and everything worked out. I just have my, my route worked out to the little caravan bar that's just outside the track. And that's where I stop <laughs> until, until it starts to subside a little bit. But, um, I I love that part of Tuscany as well because there are all those kind of hillside tracks and things where you can go through fields and and, and quite often you find that your track is blocked by somebody who's bloody had the temerity to go and plant it that year uh, whereas the year before it wasn't cropped or anything like that Um, and you you try and stay in a hotel that's got a dirt track to it through through fields and woodlands and you, you work out what fences are padlocked and which ones haven't. This sounds extreme but it's actually true. And you always make sure that whoever's in your car who's traveling with you is a bit of an expert when it comes to a sat nav, because it's not just about following uh, major roads. Obviously, you've got to have someone who can read an ordnance survey map. So you actually, <laughs> what you need is a co-driver, really, when you're getting out of Mugello. Um, so it is a, it's, it's a hell of a place. And I, I mean, I, Mugello is my number one. There is no doubt about it. And Valentino Rossi at Mugello, you know, racing some of his, you know, people like Biaggi, um, they are just imprinted on your memory. But to have seven consecutive years of winning at the top level, at the top class, pretty spectacular. We're going to miss him. (laughs) 
Certainly will. And, and as you say, Keith, winning on those different bikes, wasn't it? That was a, he, he just always seemed to rise to the occasion, wasn't it? It didn't matter whether it was a 990 Honda, 990 Yamaha, 800C. Well, even in 06, when it was such a, you know, the, the bike he struggled with, and then he turns up at Mugello, and it would, this force of nature would, would propel it around the track. And uh, I think just to give one sort of non, let's say, result-based highlight, I think it's that 2008 helmet where he had the face stuck on the top. Yeah, the scream. That's very good. <laughs> That's a sc- someone screenshot that immediately. I'm not going to pull the face that he had when he rode the Ducati there because that that was no fairy tale. That didn't work. But that's completely the other way. <laughs> Well, I mean, some some fantastic uh, memories. I've just um, googled Magello weather for this weekend. Wet and it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, all raining. Yeah, it happens Ooh. at Magello sometimes. It does, and uh, and many a race. I mean, I think Valentino has been in a situation where he's he's kind of crashed a few times when he's been in contention for podiums. It is a difficult place when it goes that way as well. I mean, it's. Um, it gets used a lot too. So uh, car guys, you know, it is a Ferrari test track, as I said earlier. Um, so, you know, might have had a bit more Formula One interest since you guys have had Formula One there a, a few times now. Discovered what a great place it is. I'll tell you what, Mugello in a Formula One car must just about be flat, apart from the start and probably turn one, I would think. Because <laughs> it is, it's so fast and flowing that with all that aero and all that rubber stuck to the floor, I should think Formula One guys must get around there about 10 seconds, 15 seconds quicker than we can. It was a brilliant. I mean, it was a COVID. It came as a COVID uh, security track, didn't it? But it, it was brilliant racing. One of the best races, actually. It's a shame it's not not on the calendar um, uh, at the moment. And then you found so, Portimao as well. You, you yeah. Bloody, you, as long as you don't start destroying our tracks with your downforce and bloody braking points, we don't mind. Well, that, we just had the Spanish Grand Prix, and you guys, the whole that turn uh, ten now has all been reprofiled for the bloody bikes. So uh, it's yeah. nice, it's a well, nice let me curve tell you something now. about that then. The turn 10 was reprofiled because you bloody <laughs> stuck a a, a, a a chicane in between 12 and 13. You stuck a 12 and, th- you know, why would you do that? Oh. I mean, you stuck that chicane in there. And because the chicane was so close to 10, we couldn't move the barrier back at 10 because they met in the middle. Yeah, now, if there yeah. was no chicane there, if there was no Formula 1 chicane there, then 10 could have been made safe. And the original turn 10 at Catalonia was absolutely brilliant. So don't you give me any of that about you bloody car blokes. All you're interested in is bottom gear corners because that's the only thing you need is a DRS. <laughs> you make a fair point. <laughs> and I do, I think I agree, that chicane, I don't know why, I don't know why it's there for, it doesn't provide anything for, for overtaking in, in, for, in Formula One at least. But anyway, that's for uh, another time, I think. I think we should do our predictions for this weekend um and uh, and try and well get them correct it's keith leading the way at the moment we've all got points thankfully though uh last year uh, quarteraro on pole took the win head of Oliveira, joan mir what are you feeling keith this year around this time around well i don't think it's going to be anything like that i've got bagnaya for a win um Ooh, straight in okay yeah i think bagnaya for me bagnaya on a ducati at Mugello just I think he's going to raise, raise, his, raise his game for that one. Yeah, but the rest is really, really, really <laughs> tricky. Bangnaya, I'm going to go for a Ducati 1-2. Miller, okay. Quattararo third. Okay. Bagnaya, Miller, Quattararo. Pete, what you got? I'm going to go Ducati 1-2 as well, Ooh. but I'm going to go for another blue bike versus red bike. And uh, I'm going to go Bastianini. No. And first, I've got to say, when will someone sponsor that bike? You know, yeah. this team is, is still without a title sponsor. And I, I mean, I've said, no, I've said to you guys off air, but if I was Ducati, I would step in and I'd have that bike red. Uh, at least until someone steps in as a sponsor, because at the moment we are seeing a blue bike <laughs> battling with a red bike. And I think, just for marketing purposes, if there was two red bikes up there, let's out oh, in Piro, of course, he'll have a wild card almost certainly mm. this weekend on the third factory bike. So there will be three factory bikes, but I just think Bastianini, he's a factory contracted rider already, as most of the Ducati riders are. Someone step in, get his, get his, get his bike sponsored, or at least have it in Ducati red. 
Because until then, we're seeing a blue versus red battle, and that's what I think will happen. I'm, I'll go Bastianini, Bagnaia second, and I'll go Quattararo third. We've seen the Yamaha... You, you've thrown a curveball with the weather there, Harry, I have to mm. say. So all of this might be rubbish. But we have seen the Yamaha do well at Mugello. It's, of course, got this the, the fastest straight of the year, but there's a lot of corners in between you know, the start and end of that straight. And we've seen in the past that Lorenzo has been very successful there. Quattararo won last year after Bagnaia fell on lap two. Um, so it, it's the sort of, sort of track where, yeah, I think Yamaha can do well. They should have the new aero package this weekend. Probably a bit less downforce. Might help a bit on the straights. We'll have to see. But uh, that's who I'm going with. Okay. I'm going to copy you. Bastianini. I want him for the win ahead of Bagnaia. Uh, and I do think that the Bastianini bike, with the Crash.net MotoGP logo at the front, I think that would look rather good. <laughs> Our faces on the back, listen to the podcast on the side. I think that would work quite nicely. I don't know. Uh, we'll have to pitch that to the team. Um <laughs> And third, I mean, I mean, Quattararo would be, I feel like I just need to go for a different option just because. So I'm going to go for the man on the mission. Um, can't sign a deal right now, but the most podiums at the moment, I'm going to put Alicia Spargo in third again. And that, because that came true last time around. And I, I'm, I'm all about Alicia at the moment. He's my man. If I can't have Ika Laquona, I'll have Alicia Spargo. <laughs> <laughs> So that's my top three. So Bastianini, Bagnaia, Alicia Spargo, Pete, Bastianini, Bagnaia, Quattararo, and Keith, Bagnaia, Miller, and Quattararo. Well, not long to wait at all. It is MotoGP race week. It all gets underway uh, in just a few days' time. I will leave you there, chaps. Uh, but make sure you're tuned in across Crash.net for all the latest news and analysis throughout the week. And then we'll be back with you next week, of course, to look back at all the action. Get your questions in, leave them in the comments section or tweet Instagram or Facebook us. Just search Crash Moto GP. Please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts and we shall see you right back here next week. Bye-bye.